Okay, today then we begin uh, with the uh, book of Exodus, okay? And uh, if you remember, uh, at the end of Genesis here, we see uh, that the descendants of Abram, Abraham uh, possess only this field and the uh, uh, tomb of Machpelah uh, in the Negev region near Hebron. Okay? Uh, but the descendants of Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and his family, are now relocated in Egypt, in the land of Goshen, the delta region of Goshen, uh, because of the famine, because of the uh, uh, influence of Joseph, that's where they relocate. And this is God's will, obviously. It's God's will that they be here in Goshen, in Egypt. Uh, we know that from a couple of sources in the book of Genesis itself. In Genesis 50, verse 20, when Joseph is speaking to his brothers um, after the death of Jacob, and they're fearing, well, now that dad's gone, Joseph's not going to restrain himself anymore. He's going to take out vengeance on us. And uh, Joseph says, no, 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 we're at peace here. And then he puts it all into perspective and says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So uh, all of this God worked together for good. Sounds like Romans 8 verse 28. Worked it all together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And uh, so he's, he's brought them now to, to Egypt for the saving of their lives, the preserving of their lives from the famine. But there's another reason for this. And again, it goes back even earlier in Genesis where God kind of reveals his hand on this. If you go to Genesis chapter 15, and this is that incident where God cuts the covenant with Abram, uh, the halving of the animals, the pathway of blood. You remember that scene? Okay. And in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay, a couple of things uh, in, in that promise that he makes there. And uh, the first thing is that uh, Abraham's descendants will be in a foreign land not identified now we know it will be in Egypt for 400 years, okay? Uh, that's also identified here as four generations uh, because God is speaking to Abram, and a generation is typically calculated at the age of the, the firstborn son. And Isaac was born at age 100 for Abram, so what you have here is generation for Abra Abraham calculated 100 years times four. And uh, God's already identified that as 400 years. So this sojourn in Egypt will be 400 years. That's what he prophesies. Okay? But what is the reason? What does God say is the reason or reasons that he will have his people in Egypt? Okay, first of all, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay. This, I think, speaks about God's long suffering. Because the Amorites are the people, the Canaanites, the ones who already live in this land. Um, and God is giving them time, 
if you will, to repent. And we know how wicked and corrupt and depraved the Amorite civilization was. I mean, they were offering children as their sacrifices. Uh, in a sense, you could almost say they originated um, um, hard porn. Uh, Archaeology has demonstrated this, and just the uh, sexual, sexually immoral, immoral practices and, and uh, so forth. So, but it's, it's showing here, I'm going to be patient even with these Amorites. <laughs> Their iniquity is not yet complete. I'm going to give them th this time. Um, he knows they won't turn, they won't change, and so eventually they'll have to be expelled from the land because of their wickedness. No, but I'm it's sorry to interrupt. Are the Amorites, is Sodom and Gomorrah part of the Amorites? Is that separate? Well, the, the Amorites really is, that's kind of a, uh, a for the, the people who are settled in this region. Canaanites are essentially the Amorites. And I don't really understand the whole Canaanite thing either. Okay, so Abraham, that's Abraham's land is Canaan. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where Jerusalem will be. So the Amorites and Canaanites are two different different groups. They're no, the same. No, they're the same, just kind of uh, different different ways of, of describing. Canaan is this region here. Okay. Uh, Canaan was actually, uh, what would you say, I guess a grandson of Noah. Okay. The son of Ham. Okay. And so Canaan then is the patriarch of the Canaanites. <laughs> um, but the Canaanites are the ones who were originally here before Abraham comes. Uh, they're also called Amorites, okay? And, but they're wicked and uh, perverse and so forth. Um, so they are, they are not followers of, of the true God. Which kind of brings me to another question. Sorry, but uh, That's fine. The, Noah and some people saw him naked and okay, um it's <laughs> Genesis nine, eighteen. <laughs> and then um Ham saw the nakedness of his father and then Noah's like curses came in. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't understand that. Okay, okay. Um, what you have here, uh, after the flood, even with this righteous man, Noah, uh, is sin. You know, he carries the sin nature into the new creation, if you will, into the new uh, post-flood um, uh, world. And uh, that's demonstrated here by his becoming inebriated, getting drunk. Uh, passes out naked. Yeah, Noah does. Passes out naked. Um, and uh, so what you have then is um, uh, the son, Ham, who sees him here and um, uh, is ashamed of his father and so covers him up, okay? Um, covers his, his nakedness. But there's some real shame associated with that uh, in terms of uh, a lack of respect for the father. Didn't, didn't the other two sons Seven cover him up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He he that's right. He just went right. and told his brothers that right. Yeah, right. Dad okay. is laying in the tent. Naked. Good, good. Which I kind of go, you know, he went and told his brothers kind of, uh, hey, guess what dad did, you know. Right. Right. You know. So it's, it's, it's really an act of disrespect. Um, and the other brothers uh, responded appropriately to cover their father's shame here, yeah. Um, but then Noah pronounces a curse, uh, but he doesn't do so directly on Ham, but instead on um, his, his son. And, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the word of the patriarch has a performative force, and so that curse will carry on now to the descendants of Canaan, who are the Canaanites. <laughs> okay? And well, the descendants of Shem are the Semites. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So, 
Um, getting back here to uh, Genesis 15 then, uh, God's purposes here. One purpose is to allow more time for the Amorites okay, uh, to, if you will, repent that he's a long-suffering God. Uh, even though they won't, he knows that this shows his mercy and his patience, his long-suffering nature. Um, but there are other purposes as well here. Uh, they will be sojourners, that is, the descendants of Abram. Um, they will be servants. They will be afflicted, okay? So they will be under oppression. But, verse 14, I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. So, God is saying, I am setting this up in order that I might bring ju judgment, vindication um, upon those whom they serve, who have oppressed them, and thus deliverance of your descendants here. So he's saying, I'm going to demonstrate my covenant um, promise by bringing them out of bondage, bringing them out of slavery, delivering them, and bringing judgment upon their oppressors. And they will also come out with great possessions. So uh, they, they will be provided for. I'm going to provide for them. Okay. But I think that there's also uh, implied within this the sense that he is going to send them to Egypt where they will be uh, afflicted, where they, where they will be under um, uh, oppression. They'll be enslaved to teach them dependence, to teach them dependence upon him. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, man, human beings, were created to be dependent upon God, okay? To, to live this life of receiving from God who lives to give, dependent on him and trusting him that God will take care of them, that God has their best interest in mind. But in Genesis chapter 3, uh, Adam and Eve, first parents, declare their independence. They doubt that God really cares for them, has their best interests in mind. And so they doubt whether they can depend on him. They lose faith, if you will, and they make themselves the Lord. The temptation, you will be your own gods, okay? make themselves number one. And so you have that symbol of sin, as Martin Luther said, man turned in on himself, no longer depending on God as the source of life. Um, in Genesis 7, then, there is so much of independence that God brings the flood, the judgment. People have declared their independence from him, and you see that again after the flood in chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel, uh, where it is, we will make a name for ourselves, we will build a tower to heaven, we'll storm heaven itself, uh, uh, this kind of rebellion and independence. Well, in chapter 12, then, you have the call of Abram, Abram about 2000 B.C., and uh, um, God now is calling him in this covenant relationship to faith which is dependence upon him, simply depending on him, uh, restoring that relationship of de dependence. And so he begins by leading, in a sense, Abram into helplessness. He says, leave your city, your father's house, uh, leave your inheritance, okay? Depend on me, trust in me, go where I will direct you. you don't, he doesn't even know where it's going. Go where I will direct you, okay? And, uh, um, and God waits till he's 100 years old to fulfill the promise for a child. Um, Sarah will be 90 when they're in the place of utter helplessness, okay? The book of Hebrews says they were good as dead, okay? So uh, this bring them to this place of absolute helplessness, and then God does his work. Uh, the descendants, coming down to Jacob, Jacob was always struggling, wrestling 
trying to uh, maneuver and manipulate, striving to get God's blessing. And uh, uh, God, in a sense, was just saying to him, just rest in me. Depend on me. Trust on me. Don't try to do it on your own. And that wrestling match kind of epitomizes that, where the Lord renders his hip um, uh, out of place and renders him uh, incapacitated and helpless as well. So now the descendants of Israel, the Israelites, will continue, in a sense, to wrestle with God. Okay? And uh, this nation that is named after Israel will uh, be brought to a state of complete helplessness, a state where they see that their strength is not in themselves. They must depend upon the Lord and God to deliver them. And so he brings them to this foreign lang land, this embryonic nation, to bring them to a place of helplessness, of total dependence upon him in Egypt. And he's the one here who has set it all up so that they can learn an important lesson necessary for understanding the covenant, and that is their absolute helplessness before him. Absolute helplessness. Okay, so this is now just a, a preview of um, the uh, book of Exodus here and, and actually into uh, uh, Leviticus and Numbers. Uh, preview of that. Uh, once again, the graphics from the Crossways series. And uh, because this is being videotaped and will be put on uh, streaming video, um, uh, I would like to again uh, emphasize the source of these visuals uh, from Crossways International, Dr. Harry Wendt, who uh, is the uh, one who originated, produced them, and has the copyright for them. And we've received permission from him to, to use this in this, uh, but um, uh, it's appropriate that we grant um, credit to, to him and to uh, his organization for this. Okay, so what you'll have now is in Egypt, God's people in bondage. So surrounded by chains here. But God will intervene, okay? And he'll do that through the mediation of Moses and the staff here that uh, miraculously turns into a serpent um, in order to show the power of God. And God will intervene to shatter the dominion of Pharaoh and of Egypt. And so this will be a kind of holy war between Yahweh and Egypt and its gods, including Pharaoh, who was considered a god of Egypt. He will then deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt through the parting of the waters of the Red Sea here, and will deliver them from idolatry because other passages uh, from uh, Joshua and Ezekiel tell us that um, um, the Israelites worshipped idols in, in Egypt and uh, under obviously the influence of their neighbors there. And he brings them then across the Red Sea and down to Mount Sinai here. At Mount Sinai, he will establish the Sinaitic Covenant, which has at its center, you can barely see it, but two tablets there, the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, okay? And uh, this will be then the constitution of the community of faith of this new nation that is surrounded, uh, surrounding this mountain and thus surrounding the covenant, the covenant of God, Sinai. Uh, at this time, also, what you have down here is the picture of the tabernacle. And uh, God will provide for his people uh, the, the uh, ceremonial law, if you will. But uh, really, this is a, a means of gospel, uh, a means of the forgiveness of sins, means of grace through the sacrifices and the rites of 
the um, uh, tabernacle. And then, uh, after that, uh, they will uh, journey in the wilderness, uh, unfortunately, for 40 years, and eventually then cross, once again, miraculously cross the waters of the Jordan River to uh, take possession of the land, the promised land. And you remember that was part of the covenant with Abraham and the promise that we see there in Genesis chapter 15, that uh, after 400 years in this um, foreign territory, they will return to take possession of the land and thus displace the Amorites, the Canaanites. Okay, so this is the overview of, of the book of Exodus. And we begin then with the setting of Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 1. So please turn to Exodus chapter 1. Uh, this is probably around 1500 BC. Roughly, let's just put it at that. Uh, maybe more accurately, you could say around 1450 BC. Okay, so Abraham was around 2000 BC. Uh, this is going to be about 500 years later. Okay, and uh, they they were 400 years then in in Egypt. Um, there are many who would date this Exodus period at around. 1250 BC. Um, in fact, uh, that's oftentimes the, the, the more accepted date. Um, and the reason is because reference is made to the cities of Ramses and the Israelites' building of the cities of Ramses. And it's at this time that you have the Pharaoh Ramses the Great, Ramses the Second. So he's oftentimes the one depicted as the Pharaoh of the of, uh, uh, the Exodus, and so in the Charlton Heston movie, uh, the Pharaoh is Ramses. In the an animated version, the Prince of Egypt, the Pharaoh's name is Ramses as well. Okay, but probably um, more accurately, with the chronology given in the Bible, uh, it's probably earlier, um, around 1450. But let's just say 1500. Okay, and what is the setting for this now? Uh, look at Exodus chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. What is significant about that statement? They were fruitful and multiplied, grew exceedingly strong. The land was filled with them from what we've seen already from the book of Genesis. That was what they didn't do at the Tower of Babel. They refused to do that. They wanted to stay all in one place, and so here they wind up almost slaves somewhere else, and, and they do. OK, OK. So this is in fulfillment of the command that God had given originally in Eden, the very first command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay. It's the same kind of words being used here. Uh, after the flood, that same command is given to Noah and his fo followers. Okay, And then the promise is made to Abram that your offspring will be as numerous as the sands of the, the shore and the stars of the sky. Okay, So now uh, they are being fruitful and multiplying fulfilling the command, but also God is prospering them and blessing them according to his promise of the covenant. Good. So they, they uh, start out in Goshen as 70 people. Okay, Jacob and his family, 70 people. But now they've grown, multiplied in these 400 years exceedingly strong so that they are strong, the land is filled with them. Okay, Well, this then becomes a threat to Egypt and its leaders. Verse 8, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Okay, So the, really the memory of Joseph and what he did to save Egypt is lost. That's forgotten. 
And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So there's two risks here that Pharaoh wants to avoid. The first one is that they become so powerful that they will overtake the Egyptians militarily. The second is that they will leave. So he wants them to stay, but to stay as slaves. They're enjoying the benefits of the, the Israelites' presence as slaves, but they're threatened by their presence there because of the military might. And so there are two solutions that he proceeds with. The first one is forced labor, slavery, putting them into slavery. And the second then is population control, specifically in terms of the military threat. And since only males fought in armies that time, it is the, if you will, control of the male population. And so for at least a time period here, the male babies are to be killed. The order goes out. The whole population is put into slavery, but the, the male population, uh, the babies are to be killed. Okay? So uh, this is what you see here on the screen. Uh, the oppression and the Israelites are put to hard labor, building the cities of the Egyptian pharaoh and the Egyptians. So they are under oppression, just as God said would happen uh, 500 years earlier. Um, the story then focuses in on one family, and uh, um, uh, the mother, um, uh, this Levite, uh, chapter 2, you have it. So the, the house of Levi, a uh, Levite woman. So it's from the, the tribe of Levi. And um, uh, this mother then has a boy, and uh, she tries to protect him from the, uh, uh, the edict of extermination. And that boy then is named Moses. Okay. And uh, Moses is a, a name that's even familiar in Egyptian literature. It has a root of, of being born, uh, uh, you know, birth. And uh, so you've got names like Tut Moses, Pharaoh. Even Ramses has the same root. The MSS -S at the end of, of that uh, comes from the same root. So um, the child um, uh, will be named Moses here. Uh, but the mother here tries to protect him uh, for three months. But any of you who have had babies knows it's hard to keep a baby quiet and, and uh, keep keep it on the wraps, okay? And uh, maybe you're living that right now, some of you. Okay. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, and so eventually she realizes she can't just keep him concealed. So she entrusts, in a sense, to the Lord by putting this baby in a back basket and sending it down the Nile. But she has the, the, the sister of the baby, Miriam, follow along watch and see what happens. Well, you're probably very familiar with the story here. Uh, a uh, princess of the royal line, and uh, some have speculated, particularly if, if you go with the earlier date, that this is the one who later becomes Queen Hatshepsut, uh, if you've heard some of the uh, um, important personages of ancient Egypt. Um, uh, we don't know that for sure, but uh, possible. And uh, she sees the baby and has pity on the baby and uh, uh, takes the child as her own. Uh, you can see here there Miriam is watching. And uh, uh, there's a communication that goes on. Um, and uh, so uh, the princess tells Miriam, I need a nursemaid now for this baby. Miriam says, I know someone who would qualify for that. And so the real mother is able to serve as the nursemaid for 
the baby. So uh, Moses is, is preserved. Uh, the implication here is that he's uh, raised in the royal house, uh, raised as a kind of adoptive prince of Egypt. Um, when he grows up, though, and he is aware of his lineage, uh, there is one incident in which he beholds an Egyptian taskmaster um, beating a Hebrew slave. And Moses then comes to the rescue and defends the slave and actually kills the, the Egyptian. Uh, but he, he tries to keep it hidden. He, he buries the Egyptian corpse in the, the sand and kind of goes his own way. Uh, but uh, shortly after that, he sees two other Hebrews who are fighting. And he tries to you know, uh, break it up. And uh, one of them says, well, who are you? <laughs> to try to break up this fight. You just killed a man. So he knows that, um, that uh, he's been seen. And uh, so uh, the word gets to Pharaoh as well. Pharaoh now uh, has the arrest warrant out for him, seeks to kill him. And so Moses flees. Okay, He flees then across into uh, the uh, Sinai Peninsula. Uh, to the area uh, that uh, was under the uh, domain of the Midianites. And he, in fact, uh, uh, settles there, becomes a shepherd, and uh, marries uh, a Midianite woman. Zipporah is her name. Okay. Has sons, uh, children. Okay. Uh, he flees at the age of 40. And he spends 40 years then in the desert, OK? And um, um, here he is, just a, a shepherd. He had been the prince of Egypt. And once again, it's, it's kind of like the Lord is teaching him, teaching him this lesson of dependence, um, humbling him. Uh, he, he's just a shepherd. And the shepherds were especially despised by the Egyptians. So his upbringing, this is kind of really going low. The Egyptians considered the shepherds those from the outside because they were primarily, the Egyptians primar primarily agricultural. Uh, they looked down upon the, the, uh, the shepherds as kind of a, a special lowly estate. And, and so he's been brought low, brought to this place of, of humility and uh, dependence. And yet, God calls him then to be the deliverer of his people. And he does that through this theophany that we call the burning bush, uh, the situation of the burning bush. This is in chapter 3, OK? Chapter 3. Um, in chapter 2, we're told that uh, God hears the groaning of his people, verse 24, and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So it all comes back to that covenant. And he remembers it. And the term remember, in the Hebrew, it's zakar. It means more than simply uh, bringing to mind. Like, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, I need to do that. But when it refers to God's remembering, it means that he now acts on his covenant. He will act on his promises. Okay? Didn't mean that he forgot about them or became negligent. But it means that now, according to his will and timing, he will act. He will act on his covenant, just as he promised Abraham. And he does then by calling Moses. Uh, this 80-year-old fella uh, through the burning bush. Uh, the bush doesn't get consumed by the fire. And uh, this is an image that we find frequently in the Old Testament where God reveals himself by fire. Okay? And it's kind of a, but it's a fire that does not need fuel. Okay? That's the point. Uh, where already have we seen God manifesting himself as fire? And Abraham kept the covenant, and he walked down between the animals, or he didn't walk, he 
passed through. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so Genesis 15, that cutting of the covenant. God comes down as this fire pot um, uh, swinging through. Here he appears again as the fire that needs no fuel. It needs, he, he, he is self-sustaining. And later on we'll see God's appearance once again as fire, the pillar of fire, okay? And that guides the people. So uh, this is a pretty common image that we have here, okay? Now, when Moses approaches the burning bush, God identifies himself, okay? And he identifies himself, verse 6, chapter 3, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look. So he calls, he identifies himself, and Moses also is directed by the Lord to take his sandals off his feet because he's standing on holy ground. And this will be a gesture that we find uh, occasionally when uh, that people come into the presence of God. Uh, when Joshua encounters the angel of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, he too is directed to take off his shoes. Uh, and it's a gesture of, of uh, humility, recognition, I am standing before the, the holy God. Uh, even today uh, in the Middle East, um, entering into what they consider sacred territory. You take off your shoes. Uh, when I was visiting there, when we would go into mosques like the Dome of the Rock, we were directed to take off our shoes. It's, it's a gesture here of, of um, reverence for the Holy Presence. Okay? And God then identifies himself by name. And what is the name that God identifies himself by? Okay, okay. So the name here, I am. Okay? Uh, more technically, I am that I am. Or um, I cause to be. Uh, uh, technically, uh, when you look at the Hebrew here, it's, it's uh, cause to be. So it, 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 there's a lot packed into this of his eternal existence, okay, uh, but also the fact that he is the source. He is the creator. He is the provider. I cause to be. Um, uh, this is in his name. And uh, the Hebrew, we call it the tetragrammaton because there's four letters. Yahweh, or in our English transcription, Y-H-W-H, okay, Y-H-W-H, um, or including the vowels here, Yahweh. Now, we've seen this name before, so this isn't the first time that it's revealed. We saw it in Genesis. But as God now uh, presents himself to Moses, uh, it's a name perhaps that was somewhat forgotten. And uh, he uh, introduces himself again as Yahweh. Okay? Um, in in the, the background of, of transliteration, the Y is oftentimes uh, also a J. And so often, and the, the, the W is V, and so uh, if you got that, Jehovah, okay? So oftentimes the, uh, those differences are made, and especially in the, the Germanic transcription, uh, these two changes are made. So uh, when you hear Jehovah, that's the, the name, it's the personal name of God. And uh, God now, and it's the covenant name, the name by which he is identified uh, in covenant. Because he is God of all people, but he reveals himself in covenant with Israel, with the people of, of the descendants of Jacob. And uh, so this is his covenant name. 
So he commissions Moses then to go, to go to Pharaoh. Okay, and um, you have to just kind of imagine what this is like going to Pharaoh, an 80-year-old man who's a shepherd. All he carries as a weapon or a, a staff of authority is this shepherd's staff, shepherd's crook, if you will. And he comes and says, the Lord God of Israel commands you, demands that you let my people go. And uh, I mean, here you've got the very personification of weakness, of one who is despised, aged, shepherd from the hicks. All he has is a stick, and he's demanding that God let the people, or that Pharaoh let the people go. Um, the point is that it's not through Moses that this victory will be won, but it's ultimately through God um, who will deliver probably around two million people from the most powerful nation on earth. Uh, the, Egypt was the most powerful empire on earth at this time. And so you've got the picture of human helplessness and the power of God will flow through him in this. Okay, so um, the first demonstration of power is uh, the turning of the staff into a serpent. Okay, um, why is this? Well, the serpent, the cobra, was a symbol of Egyptian sovereignty. If you remember, if you've seen pictures of the pharaoh's crown, uh, there will be a gold cobra. Co it's coiled around the head, and the, the, the head of the cobra is right over the forehead of the pharaoh. And so the cobra itself was a symbol of Egyptian sovereignty and power and c control. And so uh, in the changing of the staff into a snake and then the control of that, in a sense, it's depicting here, he has power over Egypt and the dominion of Egypt. The Egyptian magicians are able to produce something that looks similar, whether it was through uh, the dark powers of the occult, satanic powers uh, that were truly you know, uh, supernatural, or whether it was by a kind of sleight of hand. And we, we have archaeological evidence uh, from Egypt of of kind of ways in which the magicians would make it look like supernatural things were happening. So you'd have statues of their gods with movable mouths that uh, you'd pull a lever and the mouth would come out and smoke and stuff could come out and everybody was oohed and awed by the special effects and so forth and think, thought that it was magic. Uh, obviously it was just uh, deception and sleight of hand. Whatever the case is though, um, Moses' serpent devours the other two, once again showing who has dominion here, who really controls. And the, the demand is to let the people go. Okay? Uh, Pharaoh, though, is reluctant, resistant to that demand. And so what you have here then are the ten plagues. I, yeah. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Exodus 4, 24. I, <laughs> okay. I don't understand this at all. Oh, okay. And um, I don't, I, is there any enlightenment you can give as okay. to what in the world is going on? And it's so out of place. I just don't get it. Okay, sure. Now, and please don't hesitate to don't apologize for asking <laughs> Well, I didn't know if we were questions. still on, like, the beginning of 4 because, you know, God is, he, he, the staff turns into a snake here too, so I didn't mm -hmm. know if we'd skipped it yet. Okay, okay. No, no, this is fine. Well, let's take a look at that here, uh, Exodus 4, verse 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. So this is uh, going from 
the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. Somewhere along the way, the Lord sought to put him to death. Well, that seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, he's just sending him to Egypt to deliver his people, and he seeks to put him to death. Um, any thoughts about what's behind this? I don't know. He wants to test. I don't. I have no idea. Okay. I don't understand that entire paragraph. And I don't get what his wife does, and I don't know what a bridegroom of blood is. Okay. Okay. I mean, was he not circumcised yet? Or I yeah. Um, the issue appears to be, as it says in verse twenty-three of uh, twenty-five, Zipporah, his wife took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin. Okay, so the son, not Moses. No. Well, I was just looking at it uh, in verse 23, it says, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. And it seems to reflect, like in the Hebrew, the antecedent would be uh, the subject. And it, in the footnote there for I, it says Moses' son, mm -hmm. where the Hebrew says him. So the subject probably was Moses' son. Yeah. Right. Which doesn't make any sense, though, because this is what Moses is supposed to say to Pharaoh. Exactly. Right. Oh, good. I'm glad it doesn't make yeah. any sense. So um, <laughs> verse 23, well, it makes sense, but, but you're, you're, you're right here. Verse 23, um, thus says the Lord, Israel is my, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So already there is the reference to the 10th plague, the killing of the firstborn. In other words, if you're not going to let my firstborn go, you're going to have to let your firstborn go. You're going to have to relinquish your firstborn. And that will take place in the 10th plague then. But uh, this is kind of a new setting then, beginning with verse 24. And um, the issue here is that Moses, a uh, member of the covenant family, has not been faithful to the covenant. How has he not been faithful to the covenant? He hasn't circumcised, yeah, he hasn't circumcised his son, okay? So um, he is, he's not being faithful, his son is not even a part of the covenant community because uh, uh, he hasn't been faithful to the covenant sign here. And uh, it's saying here, in a sense, God is taking this seriously. And somehow, I mean, the text is, is very, you know, um, quick to, to pass through this. Doesn't give us a lot of details. But Zipporah knew, she understood what was going on. Um, because she immediately circumcises her son. Uh, this is something the father should have done. But she recognizes uh, why the Lord is upset here. And so she acts on it where Moses should have acted. Uh, and it, it's showing the seriousness here of the keeping of the covenant. So she's a Midianite mm -hmm. who are also descended from Abraham's son, his son Midian, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, but they are not the chosen people even though they're even children. Right, right. They're not of the line of Isaac, and that's only the line of Isaac, okay? But remember that, um, that uh, Abraham circumcised even Ishmael, okay? So that right was probably passed on to all of his sons, so not just the line. Also yeah, and we, we know that they did, okay, circumcise. But... That does not mean the Midianites are in the covenant relationship uh, that is passed on through the line of Isaac. Okay. Um, but Moses was a part of that, and his sons should be circumcised. <laughs> uh, and Zipporah, you know, this Midianite woman, knows that better than he does. So, so she takes things literally into her own hands and uh, does the circumcision. And um, when it says here, and touched Moses' feet, sometimes uh, in the Hebrew, feet is a euphemism for genitals, 
Okay, so it's kind of like, you know, you should have known to do this. Why didn't you do this? You failed in your responsibility here. And, and then she says, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Okay, you're my husband. <laughs> and, and you've caused me to shed this blood when it should have been you. So it's, it's a bit enigmatic, but I think you could still understand what's going on here if you kind of read between the lines. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess there's two ways to look at it, kind of like uh, what Dave mentioned ago. There's brackets in the NIV around Moses saying it could have also been Moses' son for those where it says Moses. And that just gives a different, I guess, a different uh, context or meaning to the passage where instead of the Lord meaning to kill Moses, he's the Lord's meaning to kill Moses' son instead. And oh, yeah. Zipporah's, Zipporah's going, oh, no, you're not going to kill my child. And taking care of the business. Oh, I see what you're saying. The yeah. him there. Okay, yeah. okay, sure, sure. And that's certainly possible here as well, that the him here refers to the son. More traditionally, it's understood to be Moses, but it's ambiguous. So... Okay. That's a very good word for it. <laughs> I th you know, the, my problem is I don't even know where the lines are from which I'm supposed to read between. I, 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 the culture is just I, okay. it's so foreign to me. Well, and that shows the depth that you can just go into such great depth here in, in the scriptures. And uh, uh, we're not going to be going into that depth for the purposes of this course. We're just going to get the basic narrative and overview of it. But the joy is that you can always go deeper and deeper and deeper here in the study of it. Okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I wasn't tracking with you. Now, now I understand. But, but that's an excellent observation. It's definitely something I'll look at, look at in the Hebrew. What's that again? It's definitely something I'll look at in the Hebrew to see how exactly it plays. Sure, um, sure. I just find it an interesting passage because it's out of, so it's nice. like, you know. <laughs> Okay, where'd this come from? And then, you know, we're back to the storyline. Like, it was right. a, a right. side note that was tossed in later or something. <laughs> right, right. Stay tuned, sir. Good. Okay, well, let's move ahead um, into the plagues themselves now. And I know we're skipping over a lot of the material here, including the, how um, Moses' appearance initially just seemed to make things worse for the Israelites. Uh, now they have to produce more bricks without straw. They have to collect their own straw and so forth. So there's a lot here that we could cover. But uh, ultimately then God shows his wonders and his power, his uh, uh, dominion, if you will, even over Egypt through these plagues, these signs. And in many ways what he is doing is waging war on Egypt, the oppressors of his people. This is a kind of holy war, okay? And the battle is the Lord's. The end result here will be that this slave nation will come out of what had been the most powerful empire in the world without having shot an arrow themselves because the battle is the Lord's. He is the one who delivers them. And it is a kind of almost military battle. The people here are only helpless bystanders, the Israelites. And it's also a theological challenge and battle against the gods of Egypt, which really are no gods, but were believed and assumed to be gods. And the plagues demonstrate this. And uh, I think the handout that you have uh, does a good job of uh, addressing that as well with the imagery of a boxing match here. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's one knockout after another here with the, the gods of Egypt. Okay? In a sense, the plagues are saying, who's really in charge here? And in chapter 9, verse 29, uh, the plagues are brought upon Egypt for this purpose, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. The earth is Yahweh's. He's not just a localized deity who uh, has dominion o only in Canaan, but he is the supreme universal God who has dominion everywhere, even in Egypt. 
and even over the gods of Egypt. And so what you have here with the plagues, it's almost as if God is taking a checklist, you know, on a clipboard, and he's saying, well, that's not a god, that's not a god, that's not a god, that's not a god. Uh, all of these gods that you put your trust in. And it was also believed that um, when nations were in contest with one another, at war with one another, the gods, the, the uh, tribal gods, the national deities were fighting one another. And uh, whichever nation would win, the assumption was that god won over the other god. And so here you've got Yahweh fighting, in a sense, against the gods of Egypt. And the first plague then is what? What's the first plague? Blood, blood. And uh, it's specifically not just water, but water from where? The Nile River. The Nile River, the source of life, and the Nile itself was considered a god, the god Hopi, the god of life. And this god of life now is turned into death. Blood, death, okay? Uh, you can't drink it. Okay. The second plague was that of frogs. Well, there was also a, a um, goddess of the Egyptian pantheon named uh, Hecht. Okay, Hecht, which was a goddess of fertility, a goddess of life, again, of childbearing. And so you've got frogs everywhere in the shoes, you know, in the beds, in the kitchen, <laughs> in the uh, undergarments. You've just got frogs everywhere. And suddenly then they all die. And you've got mounds, stinking stench um, producing mounds of dead frogs. And so the god of life here, again, dead. Just piles and piles of death around you. Okay. Um, the third and the fourth plagues are insects, uh, gnats and mosquitoes, flies and so forth. And uh, the Egyptians even honored the insects. And uh, uh, you would carry around little amulets of insects. They're called scarabs. Ever heard of scarabs? Okay. And these were supposed to produce good luck for you. Well. Insects are not producing luck for them this time. Uh, by the way, all the, all the time, these plagues are not afflicting the Israelites, showing that God is protecting his people. Okay? They're not afflicting the Israelites. Then you've got the fifth plague of, of la livestock, and the Egyptians had their cattle gods as well. Uh, the sixth were boils on the flesh of the people. Um, and uh, specifically, the text identifies the priests, those magicians, the priests, being afflicted with the boils. So they can't, they can't combat this. By the way, the, the, the magicians, the priests, were able to duplicate, or at least um, <laughs> emulate, the first two plagues, changing the water into blood, and then the frogs as well. But thereafter, they can't. And, and the ironic thing is, when they duplicate it, they're just making matters worse. I mean, they're making more blood, they're making more frogs. So it doesn't help anything. OK? So it, the, the priests then, having these, these uh, boils and these sores, it renders them unfit for service. They're not able to serve anymore. Uh, the, the seventh plague is hail. Um, and uh, they honored a rain and a storm god, kind of the equivalent of the Baal. Well, the Egyptians had their own. The eighth was locusts. Um, and uh, again, they had the, uh, uh, the gods of their crops and so forth, and now everything is devoured. And the ninth, as depicted here in this slide, is darkness. And uh, this is not the ultimate plague yet, and yet it was a biggie for the Egyptians. And why is that, Seth? Yes, because their supreme god was the sun god, Ra. And now that god turns dark, is blotted away. Okay? 
but there is light in Goshen where the Israelites are. The sun shines there, but it's dark over the rest of Egypt. And yet uh, the Pharaoh hardens his heart, will not relent, and so we're brought to that 10th plague, the ultimate plague, the, the one that God had threatened early on, okay, in Exodus chapter 4, if you don't give me my firstborn back, Israel, you'll have to give up your firstborn. Uh, but God also provides this right we call the Passover uh, to preserve his people. And it's also a remembrance then of the deliverance that will shortly commence here. Um, the Passover is a part of the covenant. Uh, it's associated with the covenant now. of God's covenant to uh, bring blessing to the people, to deliver them to their land, to preserve their life so that they might uh, prosper and multiply. Uh, remember the, the, the promises of the Abra Abrahamic covenant. And once again, we see as a part of the covenant, a meal associated with it, Passover meal, sacrifice of blood associated with it as well. Okay, An animal is sacrificed, the Passover lamb sacrificed. And uh, uh, so this is associated with the covenant. And then that blood is uh, put over the the portal beams of the homes, as you can see here, both vertical on the sides of the doors and horizontal over the, the, the uh, top of the door. So you've got kind of the, the, the almost the sign of the cross, if you will, with the, the, the blood being put on. And the angel of death that will come to kill the firstborn passes over where that blood marks a home, okay? So the blood then here is a marking, and again in covenant uh, rites, as we saw in Genesis 15, oftentimes the blood then was, was placed in between the pathway. And so in this sense, the blood then is placed in the pathway, the doorway, but it marks, uh, in a sense, the protection of those who dwell within that house. So um, the angel of death then will come and uh, um, kill the firstborn, including Pharaoh's firstborn. Um, it's interesting and significant, I think, that the Lord's Supper took place during the Passover meal. Okay? Uh, it was uh, the gospel writers make it very clear that it was during Passover that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, new covenant, another covenant meal, but associated with the Passover. So the Passover is a type of the uh, new covenant meal of the Lord's Supper. And uh, what are just some of the parallels between the two, Passover and the Lord's Supper? Okay, okay. The lambs that's been slain, sacrificial lamb. And in fact, uh, there are other places where that reference is made. Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 5, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore keep the feast. Ultimate sacrifice. Any other parallels? Well, the eating of the lamb would cause the angel to pass over them. Judged. Okay. Um, same for us, really. Mm -hmm. Eating with Christ. Okay, okay. So um, the sacrificial victim was consumed. Uh, in a sense, there's a union there. And so for us, in communion, we consume of the, the flesh and the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Okay? Other parallels. The mark of blood. Okay. Um, Christ gives us his blood, and that is a mark that the angel can pass over as well. Okay. Um, as 
Christ lives in us. Therefore, it marks the doorway. Okay. Oh, God. Okay. So deliverance through the blood. Okay. And as we, as John says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. So there is that that uh, um, mark of the blood. Okay. And it causes death to pass over us. Okay. The judgment of, of death, eternal death. Uh, cannot touch those who are marked by that blood. Okay, so it's a, it's a type, and it's a type that the New Testament specifically identifies in a number of places. Even in the Gospels, um, when Jesus was dead on the cross, and um, it, the John's Gospel tells us that the two um, thieves on either side of him, uh, the soldiers came and broke their late legs so that they might uh, die more quickly but when they saw that Jesus was already dead they did not break his legs and John said this took place to fulfill uh, what was written not a bone of its body shall be broken and that's a direct quote referring to the Passover lamb okay so it's a it's a direct association there that John is making Christ is the Passover sacrifice the ultimate Passover sacrifice. Okay. And um, uh, Paul does the same, as I've said, in um, um, Corinthians. Uh, Peter talks about Christ being an unblemished lamb um, that was sacrificed for us. And of course, in Revelation, the image of the lamb uh, that had been slain is very common. Isn't there a hyssop branch involved in? both instances too. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. The hyssop here is uh, the the branch, and it was it now is used later on in the uh, Sinaitic uh, covenant uh, liturgy, if you will, for cleansing. Okay. In fact, Paul, uh, David says in in Psalm 51, "Cleanse me with hyssop, and I shall be clean." So that's also now associated with God's act of deliverance and cleansing and so forth. Um, where hyssop appears in the New Testament in the Gospels is that we're told when Jesus was on the cross, uh, the branch that was held up that, that brought the sponge to, to quench his thirst was a hyssop branch. And it, it's again associated with the priestly activity and the, the sacrifice here that is being made. So good. You also have on the cross where between the uh, sixth and ninth hour, the total darkness, once again, three, even though it was three days for the Egyptians, you still have that darkness. Right, right, right. So the darkness um, caused by rebellion and sin now is being assumed by Christ, by the sacrificial lamb for us. Good, good, great associations. Okay, so then what you have here um, is uh, finally Pharaoh capitulating. And what an image this is here. Again, you've got this 80-year-old shepherd, Bedouin shepherd, and the one who had formerly been the most powerful man in the world, the Egyptian Pharaoh, is bowing down to him, bowing down to him and submitting to the Lord. Okay? And uh, so now the people will go forth. Um, and uh, again, it's just so impressive to me. This helpless slave nation. They had been slaves, helpless. Leaves a defeated Egypt, which had been the most powerful empire. And they leave this land of captivity that now has been completely humiliated, defeated. Yahweh's conquest over the Egyptian gods. And yet the people who leave, these victors, if you will, haven't raised a finger. They haven't shot an arrow. Um, they haven't wielded a sword. Uh, the battle has been won, and they have simply been bystanders. They've done nothing to contribute to that battle, uh, except maybe some complaints along the way. Uh, but God has done it all. And now he will lead them into the Sinai desert. 
to live, of all places to develop dependence, they cannot survive on their own. This is a place where he will teach them dependence as they go forth in the desert. And he leads them then in this pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, which will become known as the Shekinah glory. Shekinah glory of God. It's another manifestation appearance of the glory of God. OK, but before that happens, of course, there is the parting of the Red Sea.